Hello and welcome to Real Opinions. It's James here and today I'm going to be talking about Chris Nolan's latest film, Dunkirk. So, after the somewhat disappointing Interstellar, Nolan's back from his galactic misadventure and for me it's a triumphant return and really cements his place among the greats. Simply put, it's a masterpiece. So I should preface what I'm about to say with the fact that I love anything World War II, but that's why I was so excited to find out that a maker of intelligent mainstream blockbuster films was actually taking a crack at the genre. I think it's important to lay out some of the historical context about the film before I start, although I would say an ignorance or disinterest for that um, isn't really an issue. This film is about a slice of history and it doesn't really matter if you don't know the history around it. So uh, for those that are interested, by uh, the May of 1940, Hitler's Nazi forces were sort of working their way across Western Europe and uh, despite some resistance, some quite strong resistance from the Allied forces, uh, which was mainly the French and the British, the, uh, the, the Allied forces had actually been driven to the coast of France. And the result of that was hundreds of thousands of soldiers retreating to the beach, mostly at Dunkirk, where they were awaiting to be rescued. And it's from that point that the film begins. So the true story of Dunkirk is one of unimaginable loss and a miraculous rescue. But even knowing that fact doesn't really detract from the film's amazing tension. As a side note, one thing I do have to say is that this is not a D-Day film. So forget Saving Private Ryan, even though you might see the images of the beaches and the World War II theme and think that it's the same thing. It really isn't. So onto the film itself. Nolan chooses three groups of fictional characters and in doing so he kind of gives himself a bit more creative freedom uh, from that sort of historical event that I've just described. And what I would say is that the results aren't ever obvious and that kind of fictional side of things never really does detract from the drama and I would even say the historical importance of this film. The characters in the film occupy three individual strands. There's the mole, as in land, the sea and the air, which are as you would imagine they would be. So the film then opens on the land in a brief but what I would say a hair-raising chase through the streets of Dunkirk and it's there that we meet Tommy. Now while the narrative is fairly well balanced between the three strands, Fionn Whitehead's Tommy is probably as close as the film gets to a main character. Uh, the actor himself you almost certainly won't have seen anywhere else but the weak trembling private he plays is acted perfectly and watching on you can't really help but share in his sense of horror um, at the sort of the, the events that unfold and the things that he sees. And it's that terror that's what makes this film so memorable. It's almost completely free of any blood and violence, which is maybe what you've come to expect from Second World War films. And as I said before, I think a lot of people will be expecting D-Day and a repeat of the kind of gore and violence from the opening sequence of Spielberg's Saving Private Ryan. I think those people will be disappointed as, as I think will be those people that are expecting the kind of explosive action of the Dark Knight trilogy. This film's really a very different beast. Nolan manages to kind of match that tension of saving Private Ryan's opening scene without any of the, the, the same violence. And for me, that's, that's a bit of a feat, really. Um, and also, unlike saving Private Ryan, he manages to keep that sort of that unbearable tension and sense of the unknown for almost the entirety of the film's 106 minute running time. And uh, yeah, d during that running time, the film sort of crisscrosses its way between those different characters. And as it does that, a kind of a disjointed time pattern emerges. Uh, it's something familiar for most viewers of Nolan's films, fans of his work will know. Uh, Inception is sort of the, the height of that. Um, and also Memento, which was one of Nolan's early pre-blockbuster films. But unlike Memento or Inception, this film doesn't confuse you. It, uh, it just simply uses that time difference to spread uh, what would otherwise be a quite a short aerial battle across the length of the film, which allows that particular battle to match the week-long events that unfold on the beach. And also the sort of events at sea, which are over a kind of a number of days. It kind of helps with the pacing of the film, I think. So uh, I mentioned the air, 
And those combat scenes that feature Tom Hardy really do highlight highlight just how ramshackle aviation was in 1940. These scenes are a battle not just against the enemy, but also the rudimentary technology of the time. So the struggle to even get the enemy planes in their sights, let alone get a shot on target, is really genuinely gripping. It's helped too by the aerial photography. Uh, some of that is really phenomenal. And for me, it, it was some of the most beautiful imagery I've actually ever seen in a film. Um, and credit for that does go to the cinematographer Hoyle van Hoytema, who uh, picks up where he left off from Spectre and Her, which for me are two of the best looking films I've seen in the last five years. And he was cinematographer on both of those. So uh, something that I think he does, which is, is brilliant, uh, the cinematographer manages to show the English Channel to be a vast, uncrossable expanse with countless wide shots, both from the air and alongside the ships. I can't think of a film that's shown the destruction of vast war machines in the same way that Nolan's does. It's a scale that, for me, I struggle to think will ever be matched again, uh, certainly in a war film. And that's, that's what makes it such an important film for me. I think there's few directors who'd be given the kind of budget needed for this as Nolan, and fewer still who would pay such attention to the details, both in terms of the aesthetics and also the script. And it's for that reason I think this could well be the last great Second World War blockbuster. And again, for me, as a huge devotee of Second World War films, uh, that's a shame. But I think, you know, if, if this is to be the last, then it's a worthy final film. So I talked a little bit about the filming in the air. Um, the filming on the land is just as strong as that. So the wide, unsheltered expanse of the beach is shown as being a place that is just as dangerous as the hull of a Navy destroyer. The cinematography here really is some of the best I've ever seen. Uh, it's always noticeable and the whole film looks beautiful. And, you know, the cinematography here really, it serves a narrative purpose. So sometimes some films, uh, the cinematography is there just to be looked at and it doesn't really have a great purpose. Here, it looks great and there's a reason for that. Just the whole film looks beautiful and for me, that alone is worth the admission price, let alone the story, which I think is very strong too. I think a lot of people may come out of it thinking that the film's slower than a lot of other war films, and certainly the sea-based segments uh, are very slow. Those are, those are the ones that follow the superbly cast Mark Rylance, who plays a sort of a befuddled old yachtsman who kind of um, makes his way across the channel at a, a sensible pace. And it's, it's that which I think works well to create a clear separation from the military side of things that are going on on the air and the land, sort of at a more dramatic pace and more dramatic events unfolding in those. Um, although that said, even those sections aren't without their own drama. Probably the most important fact, uh, the most important purpose of, of these sort of sections on board the boat are to actually sew together the various different narratives that, that you see uh, at the start of the film. Uh, though I won't say too much on that because don't want, to, don't want to put any spoilers in that. So yeah, I've talked about the images, but something a lot of people are talking about with this film is the sound. Um, at times it's deafening, but used to good effect, I think. The sound of the engines, aircraft, and firing weapons are just vast, especially if, if you're viewing this film in IMAX, which for me, I, I would really say is essential. If you can see this film in IMAX, do see it in IMAX, because the sound's incredible. And I think watching this on tinny laptop speak speakers of a DVD really won't give you the full the full experience of seeing this film in cinema. And Nolan is obviously an ad advocate of IMAX and making big, big films and really just using the cinematic medium to its max. So yeah, do, do try and see this film at the cinema if you can. Um, it, it is worthy of a couple of extra pounds to see it in IMAX as well. But yes, yeah, so I divulge, going back to the sound, the, the Stuka dive bombers, uh, which you'll see in the plane, that's the German aircraft uh, that are kind of attacking the beach. Uh, they actually had whistles attached to them, purely to, to terrify those on the ground even more so. And sort of countless accounts from the war do, do sort of say just, just how terrifying that sound was. And in Dunkirk, the sight and the sound of them bearing down on the troops is, I would say, as horrific as anything you'll see and hear in the best of horror films. It's terrifying, it really is. So look out for that. 
As for the film's score, the legendary Hans Zimmer lends his hands to that, and it, it's a score that's audible throughout the film. Uh, for me, it, it complements the images well, even if it isn't uh, his best score, probably far from being his best score, I'd say. But what that score does is it builds towards the, the end of the film and the euphoric release of Anthony Elgar's classical Nimrod piece, which I don't know if you know the, the, the music, but if you do a little Google and listen to it, you'll, you'll definitely recognise it. It's a very British sound and it, it sort of conjures patriotic images. And when it is played on the screen, the, the images that you see are just so wonderfully British. And for me, I was, I was welling up, just, you know, hand on heart moment, really. It's the most patriotic combination of sight and sound you could possibly imagine. Possibly lost a bit on foreign audiences, I suppose. But uh, for Brits, I think, I think they'll really appreciate it. So, how do I rate this film overall? Well, for me, it's Nolan's masterpiece. I know that's a controversial statement that a lot of people won't agree with. Uh, but that's how I feel. It's the most stripped down, rudimental film it's hard to say a film on such a vast scale to call it basic and simplistic, but it really is. It's it, it's not uh, it's not a sort of mess of CGI like a lot of a lot of big action films out at the moment. For me, I was so excited to see it, and somehow it was actually even better than I was hoping for. And as I kind of said earlier, it left me wondering if I'd ever see a, a war film as good as this again. And uh, even even Harry Styles isn't that bad, which I think is saying something. So for me, it's a 10 out of 10, and all I can do is hope that Chris Nolan makes another Second World War movie, otherwise I really struggle to see how I'll ever see anything again to top this. Thanks for listening. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, then please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Twitter. Um, we'll be back with some more great content soon. Bye.